My name is uh, Marina Khrustarova, coordinator of Civic Movement Arknadzor. I'm glad to welcome you to our session. Between the past and the future, the limits to change the historic downtown. It's not secret that many megapolis have been developing for many centuries, and they have uh, many layers of the historic heritage. And the megapolises are turning, and they have new suburbs, which used to be forests, which used to be villages, and uh, rural, faraway cities. Megapol megapolises are engulfing new and new waves of migrants to big cities, and for many of them, the heritage is not their own. How, how to give the opportunity to these new people to feel and to love what has been in the city from the previous generation? This is another question. Nevertheless, analyzing the international experience, we see that these cities who are very attentive to the uh, historical layers of the past, all the cities who are trying to be attentive and uh, precise at working with this heritage, they are winning in long-term perspective. They are winning in terms of their image and uh, in terms of attraction of tourists and interests from all over the world and in t terms of the inner livelihood all those cities who take care of their f historical heritage can be proud what is in, in english called uh, civilized influence of continuity it's very difficult to translate into russian it is the succession which gives us the stability about the current day i'm very happy that we have a very strong and representative panel of discussion we have very interesting and prominent speakers this is enrico fontanari the professor of urban science from uh, venezia uh, patricia o'donnell from the united states the, the head of the heritage landscape sergey mirzayan is the first deputy head of the Department of Historical Site at Moscow, and Mr. Gigorsky, the head of Strategic Analytic, Ken Bernstein, the head of the Preservation of Historical Heritage of Los Angeles, and Yukaterina Pronicheva, the director of VDNH, our today's host. We have one hour. That's why I would be very strict. So about eight minutes for each presentation. Speakers know that they have a, a golden uh, card with a T sign, which means time. I give the floor to Enrico Fontanari, who is an expert of UNESCO. And he's going to talk about a new concept of UNESCO, which is called uh, historic urban landscape. Uh, historical urban landscape, as I have mentioned already, this concept uh, urges all the countries to move from uh, preservation of separate uh, assets uh, to the preservation of landscapes in total. Please take the floor. Thank you. thank you, Marina. Thank you for the invitation and all your work. And thank you to the forum for the opportunity of discussing the important issue. And I go straight to the point as we have a short time. And, uh, Excuse me, Enrica. Uh, I just want to check, does the microphone like, Does the mic work? Can be he heard? Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I was thinking and saying that I'm going straight to the point because it's a short time. And uh, I will resume some issues. I hope you can read on my back because uh, there are a lot of issues written. Uh, the adoption of this la the last uh, heritage recommendation adopted by the UNESCO in 2011 on the historical urban landscape the main reason of this recommendation is trying to update the uh, view on heritage and the role of heritage in urban context particularly, and uh, to introduce also uh, a possible different way of implementing the action in uh, uh, facing the uh, role of urban heritage within the urban development. Uh, one of the important things of the concept of the historic urban landscape is the enlargement of the view of the the enlargement of the view of the meaning of historic heritage is not only historic center not only historic ensemble is broader urban context and geographical context and also the recommendation is a non-binding soft law is more a, a recommendation that shows a way to act but also introduces some new attention. If we talk about heritage, the problem is not only restoration, it's not only how we preserve it, the problem is to find a way how we transform it in a key tool of the urban development. 
So the relationship with urban management is quite important. Some images to show that we pass from the traditional monuments, Palladio, the modern monuments, the Docomomo, towards an attention also to another heritage, like the office and industrial heritage of the, of the beginning of the centuries, like building like important uh, remains of the Second World War, bunkers that don't look like a great heritage, they don't look like something that we want to preserve, but the idea is that we have to look at those important uh, heritage as a tool for the urban development. The implementation is quite important of this, uh, the suggestion of the implementation, because we open to a, a landscape that is, uh, Patrice O'Donnell will talk about it with more <coughs> uh, knowledge than me. Uh, we open to a different perceptive view on heritage, not only the uh, historic, uh, artistic history. We open on the way how to try to integrate historical layers within the urban management uh, issues. Using the traditional urban planning tools, layers, uh, urban layers, mapping, surveys, but <coughs> towards uh, transforming them in tools for the management plans, how we will uh, build a policy, a correct policy on, those, on the idea and the <coughs> goal and the aim of the preservation of this, of this heritage. So some images, <laughs> uh, quick to finalize my intervention, on what, what do we mean as broader uh, con urban context. This is the historic center of Bologna, uh, part of a research we did for the UNESCO last two years ago. This is the, one of the biggest of the of your European <coughs> historical centers, uh, has been protected. <coughs> this was the protected, traditional protected areas. And this is the enlargement that we did on the protected areas, including many of the neighborhoods of 20th century. <coughs> So just as we are in Moscow, I know there is a big debate on the, and I've seen some examples, I'm happy that some of the administration is here, some examples here in the forum, that uh, let's say we should think about how we face the big residential production realized in the second half of 20th century. Uh, beside the structural problem, material problems, I think we should look at those big uh, residential heritage, not only from an economical point of view is quite important, uh, but also considering their values. This is the historic urban landscape approach. The different values that they have in terms, for example, as comfort. Those urban areas are not any more peripheral, are more central. Maybe they have a more, uh, better comfort of condition, and so on. So this is just to make you an example of how Bologna passed from the historic center to the historic city. And the concept of historic city is, of course, open and, bro and broader. And including, of course, the relation that is still Bologna and uh, his surrounding in landscape and geography, all the hills. So linking the urban heritage to the landscape. This is the, the green, the big green area. How we connect the two, the two aspects. Uh, using new, new, not only restoration, using also some other ways to uh, look at the heritage. There are many. I just show here the creative, uh, uh, the creative way. Of course, Cristo on the urban heritage is well known, and of course, of also the name intervention is very well known. I just reminded. But for example, it's quite interesting this in landscape intervention again of Cristo last year on a lake in Italy, and a, a lake protected heritage, nearly abandoned, uh, unknown. With this intervention of the floating piers of her of Cristo. Hundreds of thousand people visited last year, and now the tourism has increased also too much. 78% of the Airbnb. Airbnb is not is worrying, but and so you can transform bunkers in the theaters. Uh, and the last issue that I want, I want to present is as again an example of Bologna, as the in the preparation of this forum they asked the relationship between administration and private. Uh, stakeholders. Uh, we have a, lo a lot of heritage building abandoned in Italy. These are the monastery system. What we starting to use is not only the real estate stakeholders, but also the uh, association, NGOs, 
and introducing the possibility of temporary use, using creative intervention, opening to possible social housing, including, this is an example of a management plan for a, 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 with many, many layers for the, <coughs> and I think finalize showing that also in Moscow you don't have only your well-known monuments, you are enlarging your attention to other monuments like the industrial heritage, and this is something that I think is quite important. And you also have some intervention. The first one was the, f the first garage, but then is the second garage that we visited last year, thanks to the Moscow Urban Forum. That uh, is, uh, is an intervention that I think is quite interesting, uh, realized by the studio OMA, and that is, can be considered an example of the way that we should follow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fantanari. I really hope that this approach, the attitude to the heritage landscape, historical landscape, is going to be adopted in Russia and in a more practical way. I would like to give the floor to Patricia O'Donnell, who is architect by uh, profession, historical heritage landscape uh, head, who is an expert of UNESCO is the practicing architect. She can talk us about the practical opportunities to implement this approach in our everyday life. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I want, wish to indicate that the historic urban landscape recommendation created by UNESCO uh, followed a, about seven-year process um, beginning in 2004 to look at uh, new ways of considering the city with the focus initially on um, star architecture and important new architecture in historic centers and its ability to really shift a uh, city image. And the concern I think that we have in the world of historic preservation is often reactive and defensive and the historic urban landscape recommendation is instead proactive and indicates in uh, a clear manner that development and preservation are compatible and that there's an opportunity in this broader framework to look at the global commonwealth of urban heritage and use that to retain city uniqueness. The reason, one of the foundational reasons for travel is experience of new places. If as we continue to globalize, we lose our individuality and the uniqueness of cities by dumbing down their heritage, their traditions and their practices, the tangible and the intangible, we then uh, lose that uniqueness and counteract what we're trying to achieve. So this approach integrates uh, heritage assets as a foundation for culture-based sustainable development. So the recommendation has four tool groups and it's about looking at dynamic living cities in an integrated change management approach that is underpinned by effective gov governance. I think all of you uh, with any experience will know that good government is the foundation for effective action. So the four tool groups applied individually are civic engagement of communities, knowledge and planning, regulatory systems and laws, which may also include traditional systems, and finance, the economic aspects. So I was asked to speak to you about some examples and I wanted to update this 2011 soft law and consider that uh, we now have the 2015 UN Sustainable Development Goals for the, or the 2030 agenda after that 2011 law and then we also have the new urban agenda. So in uh, Quito last year in October this report Culture Urban Future, UNESCO, the first ever global report on culture and sustainable development was launched with the intent of creating a baseline knowledge about how heritage was being treated across the world and what that meant to how we think about the historic urban landscape approach, how we integrate it with the UN SDGs and with the NUA, the new urban agenda. So these really create some opportunities and in 
all of this work, heritage is seen as a driver and an enabler of development. So a couple of projects uh, that I've had some involvement in. This is a World Bank piece for India's heritage cities. They had a situation where they had, uh, immediately before President Modi, they had put in, in place the Nehru City Development Initiative and they found after five years that they were building roads and putting in pipes. And they turned to the World Bank and said, there really wasn't what we had in mind. We really were looking for overall uplift and an integrated movement of heritage cities of India towards sustainability. So I was one of the several contributors to this approach for inclusive urban revitalization guidelines. So keywords, inclusive, and revitalize. There is a real complex, you need to upgrade clean water supply, you need to upgrade sanitation. If you're looking to get the Ganges to be unpolluted each city, you need to upgrade clean water supply, you need to upgrade sanitation. If you're looking to get the Ganges to be unpolluted, each city along the Ganges has to manage its water and its waste more effectively. But the process really can be simplified in something that's cyclic. You can say, okay, the first thing you do is build your team. The second thing you do is engage the community to talk about what they value, not simply the archeological register of monuments. Using those input, shape a city plan, work together with the community to define target projects, carry out that project, look at how well it did, look at performance measures, tweak the ideas you have with that new um, viewpoint, look at how you can undertake the next project more effectively and use this as a cyclic iterative route. At uh, the Philippines for the World Bank social sector, we did a technical assistance at Intramuros, and in this case, there were four components to the team. There was the work I did, which, which was an identity and urban design guideline integrated, the physical and the historic to how you could do an appropriate, um, suitable development that would meet the historic objectives in a city that had massive World War II damage how you could more effectively partner, so the development of PPP agreement structures, how to address the informal dwellers, which is a large percentage of those who live in, within Intramuros. This is the Spanish city core in Manila. And then uh, look at the issues of mobility with the port nearby and the metro nearby and what's happening within Intramuros. So within that, uh, the piece on the guidelines looked at all aspects of Intramuros, and in this um, piece, we looked here at the open space and built form in order to renew and uplift the walled city. This is also an interesting overlay. Historic areas have multiple values. In this case, we had a World Heritage listed Baroque Cathedral that had not been bombed in the war and was thought of as an act of God that it remained. And this is a hard place for those in Manila. So the Philippine public feels that Intramuros is a core location. So anything done there really needs to recognize the intangible values to the people of the Philippines. So I want to suggest to you um, that cities are vessels of cultural diversity and biodiversity. And as we go forward, greater biodiversity will be needed in cities in order to have cities be sustainable. So this is a Venn diagram that looks at the overlap of cultural diversity and biodiversity. We often have a lecture on urban forests and a lecture on cultural heritage, but there is a very strong potential integration. Cities are where the future will be won. Culture and nature integration is required. So in Pittsburgh, we looked at the issue in a Rust Belt city of bringing all the regional open spaces of large size together, integrating them from a sustainable perspective, local culture, neighborhoods, 
environment, economy, and society, the three pillars of sustainability as defined in the Brundtland Commission report in 1987, and looking at these 1,800 acres as cornerstones for a vibrant future city. The extension of connections and a series of projects. One of those was the development of an urban common. You see at the top the historic view. What it had become was a really not very nice surface parking lot. Bringing it back to a common public space has returned a heart to the neighborhood. And it is amazingly successful and highly used. Historic cities are for the people who live there first and for those that visit second. Another really important project was this work on a very tiny modernist Mellon Square. The project really had a very big ka factor, about a $7 million investment, a $4 million endowment, and over $300 million in surrounding development as this small square was restored on there. Uh, so the approach here is to have inclusive, resilient cities through culture, retaining and managing heritage in an urban century, reconnecting the city, using the historic urban landscape approach for the future of urban heritage. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patricia. Thank you for some wonderful uh, examples. And I would like to pass the floor over to Sergei Mikhailovich Mirzayan, the first deputy of the Department of Cultural uh, Heritage in the city of Moscow. And he's a chief inspector in the area of uh, state control of cultural heritage in the uh, city of Moscow. And he will give you an example of uh, 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 PPP, private-public partnership, uh, in terms of uh, preserving uh, cultural heritage. Thank you so much, dear partners and colleagues. I need to tell you uh, about our program, one ruble per one square meter. And I would like to uh, update you on Moscow to give you uh, on the situation. So at the moment, we have about 500 uh, uh, historical sites uh, at both federal and regional uh, levels and also we have 2000 uh, sites which were uh, considered as modern uh, cultural sites and they will go to the extended uh, register of uh, historical sites and our common goal is to preserve their historical and cultural level and adapt them for modern use and also uh, perform renovation works to make them uh, a decoration for the system. So uh, in 2011, the new team uh, came together with the new mayor, Sergei Sabanin, and the task was to think over an efficient mechanism of how we can uh, get uh, historical and cultural sites uh, belonging to the city of Moscow involved. Um, I'm talking about uh, sites which uh, required uh, uh, considerable investment. We had to think about such a mechanism. So the ideally the investor should see a profit uh, in case he renovates building. And we also needed tools to ensure high quality when working uh, over uh, restoration of a site to exclude situation uh, when a historical site is only used uh, for the benefit of a user, which may b contradict to preserving uh, the cultural value of the monument. So we had to modernize the existing uh, program, and uh, we developed a program called uh, One Ruble Per One Square Meter. Uh, this is uh, a po uh, how it's commonly referred, and uh, the point is that the city authorities will select a site, uh, like a building in the city center. So this is a general rule. In the city center, of course, we have a, it's like flooded with uh, uh, historical and cultural monuments. So we selected some projects and uh, we uh, uh, took uh, off all the property rights from the third uh, sites, the third parties, and uh, uh, we had to uh, terminate some contracts, uh, you know, even 
in court. Uh, we had to shape some land plots, but um, actually we did some legal preparation uh, for these sites uh, to be uh, to be ready for the auctions. So the rules were quite simple. So a site uh, was evaluated uh, in terms of an annual rent. Uh, so it was the starting point uh, for the for the tender for the auction. So stakeholders which wanted to work with the site uh, would then uh, uh, have an auction and trying to offer a higher price and this party which would give the highest uh, rent rate uh, per year would be the site uh, the city would uh, uh, conclude uh, uh, the contract with uh, all the obligations, including uh, repair works and renovation works, uh, uh, according to the rules applicable for the uh, cultural and historical sites. So uh, the uh, contracting party had to develop uh, all the required documents uh, and to make sure it's uh, in line with the uh, restoration rules and it would submit it to, for approval by the committee for pre historical preservation. Next, uh, the next step is performing renovation um, according to the time schedule and following the results of the restoration, we prepare the reporting documents and the official ex acceptance by the uh, supervisory agencies which uh, look for look after um, historical monuments so after uh, the official acceptance the tenant has the right to and he will of course use this right he will contact uh, the uh, city property department and would uh, conclude an additional um, uh, re rental agreement and after that uh, the um, rent rate would become one uh, ruble per one square meter for the period of time of up to 49 years um, so, but it would include uh, the cost of restoration works. So the rules are pretty simple. They allowed us to create uh, the mechanism which would encourage a tenant to uh, perform renovation or restoration as quickly as possible, but which would allow us as a, a preservation agency to monitor and control uh, all steps. and. Uh, and we would be allowed to terminate works uh, according to the guidelines. So um, we restored over 20 sites and uh, uh, nine of them were accepted by the department. So uh, for seven of them, uh, we moved to that ruble uh, per uh, square meters rate and two are, uh, for the two of them, the projects are pending. Also, uh, Restoration, uh, 11 more sites are under restoration at the moment. I'm sorry, we have a technical problem with the slides. I would like to show you some, some sites uh, which went through the auction procedure and where uh, works were completed. So the first site, a building. So it's a very exciting building. Uh, our Residents know it uh, from an old uh, Soviet time movie, uh, 12 Chairs. One of the heroines, uh, one of the characters lived in the building. But by the point of time we got it in 2011, it looked, uh, as you see on the slide, uh, it looked li like a, a very shabby old building. Sorry, you only have one uh, minute. Okay, so I will do the slideshow and also we did the restoration uh, so you may ask why you have so few objects objects uh, or sites uh, covered by the program but as i said there are uh, certain limitations so um, this building should be in unsatisfactory conditions 
Um, and we analyzed all our cultural sites recently, and we realized that in Moscow we have 250 cultural sites in a state like this that can be involved in the program, but not all of them uh, are owned by the city. Some are in federal ownership and some are owned by private persons. So apart from this program, we work with federal agencies so that they could work with their own uh, sites and with private owners, um, so we give them obligatory instructions so that we could control sites to make sure uh, sites in having unsatisfactory conditions would undergo restoration as quickly as possible to, to breathe a new life into these buildings. Thank you, Sergei Mikhailovich. So you finished um, a little bit faster than I expected. So uh, I would love to. Uh, to ask you one question. So, what are uh, stakeholders involved in the program, like uh, state organizations, public organizations, or private persons, or are they the same people for all the projects? Well, an interesting question. Uh, situation is different, but 90% of uh, sites uh, are covered uh, by small and medium businesses. Uh, most sites are located in the downtown, in the city center. They are not quite big. Uh, so the average uh, area would be of two to three hundred square meters. So that's why they are uh, interesting for uh, small businesses. They can open a cafe or offices after renovation. Um, so uh, as for repeat participation, yeah, we have examples that some people uh, who perform the work so they come back to us and they struggle very actively. So as for our 20th uh, site uh, covered by uh, the program, so the initial price went up 130 times. It was for the first time. Before that we had like uh, that uh, the rate grew 11 times, but this time it was 130. Thank you so much. I would like uh, to wish your program to develop successfully, and I would like to give the floor to Sergei Georgievsky, uh, the general director of uh, uh, the Agency of Strategic Development, and he will present uh, the plan for developing new territories of Moscow. So, in 2017, uh, so we launched a survey called Moscow Re. Uh, industrial Moscow. So it investigates the typology uh, of uh, Moscow industrial territories and focuses on benchmarking it, uh, them with other uh, industrial territories in the world. So the main principle laid down in this survey is that we consider a site from uh, four dimensions heritage, architecture, uh, civil engineering of the territory itself, and uh, a economy that unites its all and makes our um, research more practically focused. So the legacy of the architectural heritage in Moscow is quite long. It began back in uh, 18th century from uh, uh, handicrafts and after the Industrial Revolution in the middle of the 19th century uh, there was a big uh, development along the rivers of um, the Moskva, the Yauza, the Saturn, and after big industrial clusters were formed uh, uh, around the Moscow uh, Ring uh, Railway. In 1915, uh, we see 150 production facility territories in the Soviet Union uh, from the second part of the 20s, all these uh, production facilities uh, are reconstructed, they are changed, they get a new momentum, and in this construction, leading uh, the most prominent architect uh, of uh, their age take part, Ilya Gowasov, Lisitsky, Nikolai Guli, and uh, many others. And we can say that in uh, 20s and 50s, uh, there is a new number of projects being formed which can be related to the most prominent monuments of uh, production architecture, a number of which still do exist and which have uh, architectural and historical cultural uh, value for us. In 1935, in general plan, 
the uh, industrial territories uh, emerge as uh, industrial zones when the companies are grouped and we see not separate production facilities but the whole territory is based on the cluster principle and we see that the strategy of the city and the fact of this uh, uh, factory's emergence on the master plan 1935 speaks of great importance and 52 industrial zones are formed and starting from uh, 1939 to present this is still true we have about 79 production areas uh, formed, out of which, due to the transformation character of the city and post-industrial economy, as of today, about 10 sites are still operating as uh, production facilities. And among uh, the officially uh, operating production facilities, about 50%, 52% still function for the purpose intended, and others have a new content and have new development. Mostly talking about what kind of uh, sites they are, these are bread producing and power stations. I would like to mention that talking about the industrial territories, we do not consider transport legacy. It is very important. It is a separate uh, uh, object for research. We look at factories, production facilities at uh, power stations. We can see that uh, closer to 2000, it is seen on the map that the production facilities are migrating out of the city. They go to the suburbs and outskirts of the cities. And still, the legacy monuments still stay in the center of Moscow. but they are not production facilities anymore. They are losing this status and they are used uh, for different functions. And talking about the research and studies, we see that in St. Petersburg, for instance, in, as of today, there are huge uh, complex studies and research of the industrial legacy, its potential and capacities. Talking about Moscow, unfortunately, uh, these kind of studies in a low number. Many of them are carried out by private developers in their own uh, sites and are close to the broad audience and are not open data, unfortunately. So we cannot assess the volume of the studies and research that we do have. That is why this uh, topic is very relevant in some uh, assemblies, separate uh, buildings have a status of the m monuments of uh, historical legacy. This uh, process has many obstacles, many uh, sites are in private uh, ownership. There is no complex approach to revitalization of this process, and very often we cannot give the exact assessment of the presence or absence of this uh, sites in these production facilities which are still operating or which are losing its uh, uh, prior purpose. So talking about three major approaches to the development of uh, uh, production facilities, we see three vivid uh, tools. The first one is the who uh, demolishing and these uh, sites are demolished, mostly residential complexes are built and uh, sometimes office buildings. We see the approach in terms of reconstruction when we take care of uh, the uh, site, but the most uh, valuable still stay in place, but other sites can be demolished. Here, the architecture intervention is quite huge of modern uh, architecture as well. So we can have a hybrid approach. The third is the adaptive reuse, which requires huge number of investment, but which allows to get the ensemble of the site, which is regarded in this or that case, but to find a new functional content for this site and at minimum uh, cost to revitalize the site to get it back to the city and the sites of the reconstruction on uh, adaptive reuse is the process when the city has new territories open which will uh, be beyond defenses which were not uh, accessible anymore we 50 by 50 when we talk about about demolishing and reuse uh, about a small number of them are and the adaptive uh, reuse so illustrating every approach talking about demolition we have a dilemma for the last 15 years we have demolished more than uh, 20 sites what can we see very often after this uh, activity within these 10 years this territory is 
uh, not uh, worked with, no sites are produced. So a better approach and more sophisticated, detailed approach is a golden island where the building started on last year. We see uh, different factories. We tried to single out uh, vivid examples demonstrating these new sites. Talking about uh, adaptive reuse, we see more delicate approach, which is called in the world. Uh, temporarily use, which allows to most delicately with a uh, low number of intervention without hard intervention to preserve the as assemble and the site and to give a new purpose. And uh, we can uh, classify uh, this approach into points. It's either a complex approach when we see a single holistic uh, system uh, content based on art practices on the center design art clusters which have a vivid direction or we see a softer approach when there is no complex vision but there is a delicate uh, content and a functional zoning for different purposes intended which can be in demand in this site and which are shaped with the participation of uh, local communities which are in place in different territories uh, so one minute please so and reconstruction which demonstrates that the most valuable sites are regate. We see the examples of armor and the gas uh, pipeline, for instance, which allow us to get a new program and for midterm, starting with minimal intervention, but then to implement the process of reconstruction to turn them into new, very significant points on the map. There are a number of uh, sites, uh, the fate of which is not clear. It is huge potential for the city as these objects are in the number of 15 and 20. We see that in, in those 17 territories, which within our uh, reconstruct Moscow re uh, produce production in Moscow, these sites which can radically influence the development of these uh, districts and neighborhoods where they're situated to give the prerequisite for further development of this city in the future. And we have some projects on a number of these sites, but there is no building activity for some of these sites. There is no uh, strategy at all. So it leads us to the conclusions which uh, the main hypothesis of our research and which are proved through these territories we have analyzed already as of today, the city doesn't have a complex program of inventor of very uh, valuable uh, Sites preservation it is very important for the local city identity, the prevailing strategy for the last two years. We see that many uh, sites are demolished with uh, the building uh, for residential and office purposes, but along with that, we see an example of those 10 sites which uh, have gone through temporary use that economic uh, feasibility is quite uh, questionable. Those sites uh, is like Art Place, Vizarda and other sites demonstrate that through reconstruction, through temporary use, you can see sustainable business financial model. But along with that, you preserve the diversity and high quality of the city environment. And what is very important to note in this regard that the industrial legacy, the industrial territories, regardless of their state status uh, being operate, operative or not, there's the main resource of, for Moscow as of today. It is a resource which allows to drastically uh, bridge those gaps and deficits which we have in cities to solve the macro problems of the city and to give the prerequisite for further development of Moscow. And it is the uh, last resource. And if we take a look at this systematically, we have this program in the city. If we take a look at complex approach to the trajectory of the, our city development, can be changed and here we can solve our environmental issues, social cultural issues and many other issues. That's what we urge for. We hope that we have many opportunities to talk about this research. It's going to last for the whole year and to show different parts of this research at different platforms. Thank you very much for your presentation. I give the floor Ken Bernstein, the head of the Heritage Preservation of Los Angeles. Ken is going to talk about how the private-public partnership happened in downtown, uh, historical downtown of Los Angeles, and how these uh, principles of temporary use and adaptive reuse, which uh, Sergey has mentioned already, uh, developed in Los Angeles, California. Please take the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dobre din. 
And uh, be before you adjust your headsets, I will be speaking in English, just want to assure you. And it's a great pleasure to, uh, to be with all of you in Moscow and to learn uh, from Moscow, from the city. And I think my presentation builds very much on some of the ideas you just heard in terms of what uh, is being uh, worked on in Moscow. And in terms of learning from Los Angeles, I want to first just address many people, I think, have misconceptions about Los Angeles, uh, that you might not have uh, much to learn in an older city. We are a much younger city, certainly, than Moscow. Moscow and most European cities, uh, but Los Angeles does have a very rich uh, architectural heritage. Uh, we are more than uh, Walt Disney, Mickey Mouse, uh, freeways, palm trees. Uh, we do have a, a very rich built legacy, a legacy of historic landscapes as well. And this is a, a program to uh, revitalize our historic downtown. Los Angeles is a multi-centered metropolis, but we do have a hist historic downtown. Um, which uh, in its heyday um, was uh, uh, a lively commercial district. We had the Wall Street of the West Coast on Spring Street um, in downtown. Our Broadway counterpart of uh, New York City's Broadway didn't have historic um, uh, th theatrical venues, but it was the greatest collection of historic movie palaces of any city in the world. A dozen remarkable, opulent movie palaces in a six block area of LA's Broadway. Flagship department stores that looked much like uh, what we see uh, here in Moscow near Red Square. This was all in a very lively um, downtown. Um, but this downtown was in many ways abandoned for many decades. We had in the U.S. a program of urban renewal, of clearances of, uh, of downtown. The, the mantra was uh, really about new construction and replacement of historic buildings. We had a historic neighborhood in downtown called Bunker Hill that had historic Victorian era homes from the 1880s and 1890s in the heart of downtown. It was by the 1960s entirely cleared away. You can see this photo of transition of one of the last of the homes with one of the first of the high rises that was to replace it. Um, and what happened was the, uh, the remainder of the historic downtown, uh, so this area got redeveloped as a new financial center. Much of the rest of downtown was largely just forgotten and abandoned. And you had 12 and 13 story buildings for the most part that were entirely vacant above the ground floor retail space for a period of 20 years or more uh, in downtown. Some government uses went into some of those, but largely we could not get anyone to lease any of that space above. Um, we had a New York-based developer come to Los Angeles who began to see some of those buildings in a different way. His name was Tom Gilmore, came to Los Angeles in the late 1990s and purchased some of these buildings at really uh, pennies on the dollar, what, what would be uh, uh, the, the value of many of those. But he ran up against some restrictions in trying to reuse those buildings. Our uh, building codes and our planning and zoning codes in Los Angeles were really built for suburban development and required ample setbacks and significant parking to be provided for each individual building and much more. Um, so we needed in the ci in city government to pass a new law, the Adaptive Reuse Ordinance, uh, that was using Mr. Gilmore's project as kind of test cases to enable the conversion of some of these buildings to housing. So there was waiving, uh, parking restrictions, things like floor area restrictions, setbacks and height, limits on unit size and density. And the idea was that these projects could bypass the complicated types of planning approvals we need typically to, to get projects approved in the United States and in Los Angeles and go directly and get a permit for these projects with very little restrictions. So to make downtown the most attractive place to do new residential development. Um, so this law was passed in 1999. There were some building code uh, counterparts to that requirement. Initially, we did those as uh, temporary guidelines so we could try out some of those code requirements before they were codified and made into law. And then the adaptive reuse ordinance itself was extended beyond downtown because as it, as it began to gain momentum, many of our local city council members said, well, we want this too in our areas of the city where we have historic buildings. We'd like to see it extended in various ways citywide. 
I was working during these years, I'm, I'm now in city government, I was working for our non-governmental, our non-profit historic preservation advocacy organization, the Los Angeles Conservancy, on this program. And we, as we talked about downtown revitalization, got a great deal of skepticism. During those years, it was believed that no one wanted to live in downtown Los Angeles. And no one certainly would develop housing in downtown, which was really a, a daytime downtown where the sidewalks kind of rolled up after dark. Um, and so we took a lot of marketing of uh, Los Angeles' downtown. We actually held roundtables for private lenders and developers and took them on tours of many of the historic buildings, identified a map of 50 buildings that could be converted very easily to housing, and got uh, the appointment of a city staff member to be the point person for this program. Uh, we've, you've heard today already about public-private partnerships. In the U.S., most of our historic buildings are not governmental-owned. These are all in private ownership, even though they are very significant architecturally and culturally. We need to create financial incentives for these owners to rehabilitate their structures. We use a federal rehabilitation tax credit, um, which is key to the status of some of these blocks as uh, being on our National Register of Historic Places that enables the use of this tax credit. And we have a local tax credit in Los Angeles that builds on a state of California program called the Mills Act, which reduces property taxes for owners of historic properties who reinvest in these properties. And that was a very significant incentive making these projects possible. So just to show you a couple of case studies of uh, successful projects that occurred, Los Angeles, before we had our freeway system, did have a trolley system, a transit system. This Pacific Electric building was the headquarters of that system. Henry Huntington was the private entrepreneur who built this out. And this was the city's first skyscraper, first high rise in 1905, and was the transit hub of the city and the offices for Huntington's building. But this is one of those buildings that was vacant for 20 years. So from 1989 into the early 2000s, it was vacant. It was redeveloped into 314 residential units with many of the historic features preserved. It, uh, in its heyday, had a private club, the premier private club in the city called the Jonathan Club, uh, which had long since moved on, and it became a, a center for residents. And this is just showing you um, some of uh, uh, what was done at the uh, Pacific Electric Building. A more modest example, smaller building, one that, uh, was the Douglas Building, built in 1898, a few blocks away. Uh, significant architect, and it also sat vacant for years. And this was converted into condominium, so owner-occupied housing, and again, used that Mills Act incentive. The results of the ordinance are dramatic. Um, in just 12 years, the Adaptive Reuse Ordinance downtown triggered 76 separate projects um, and over 9,000 new housing units in the city, uh, including, uh, those are 9,000 new total units, almost 2,500 of those are condominium units. Maybe in the question and answer, since I'm out of time, there are some policy considerations. Um, the revitalization of downtown has, in many ways, made downtown a victim of its own success. There's concern about the gentrification and economic change of downtown, um, and whether enough affordable housing has been provided by all of this. But by and large, we really do feel that this is a replicable program for cities that have high concentrations of vacant historic buildings are looking to bring new life, uh, new residential life, and new street life that this generated um, as a result of the Adaptive Reuse Ordinance. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Ken. Uh, thank you so much, Ken. This is a truly exciting history for urban revitalization, I heard. And I would now like to give the floor to Ekaterina Pronicheva on the project of how uh, the all uh, Soviet uh, um, exhibition was restored. Um, so, good afternoon. First of all, I would like to welcome you all to. VDNKA, our um, wonderful city, which is located in the uh, in Moscow's downtown, and tell you about our experience of working with the historical space, with this unique uh, com historical complex, uh, dating back to the middle of uh, 1920. So, what is VDNK like? Uh, uh, as historically, it was called the All Union uh, Exhibition for Achievements of the People's Economy. Uh, but the principles laid down uh, behind uh, this VDNK, uh, um, and the 
it didn't just copy the principles behind Expos. It was like an, a mixture of uh, an expo space and a museum, um, an exhibition town which should work uh, within the country and to tell uh, visitors the history of the country, which should uh, de develop uh, in line with uh, interest. So let's uh, not talk about uh, political and ideological side of this monument. However, no, uh, this unique uh, compound which uh, started to build in 1930s is part of our legacy. So in short, it was called Vesehave and Vedinhanao. So this is the master plan from 1935, which, uh, from which uh, VSHV originated. It was the design project uh, approved uh, by the uh, town hall, so the project by Mr. Oltarzewski. So um, that was the backbone of developing the territory. So. Uh, we're still based on this master plan. Later on, in 1939, the exhibition opened and the original principles changed. So the exhibition uh, was permanently open. Uh, the halls uh, should work or uh, should be used for more than five years. So it uh, became an architectural compound. And later on, the territory underwent a number of uh, renovations. So after World War II, um, so the territory was uh, expanded. And beside the continuous trend uh, for adding uh, fixed uh, buildings, there was a transportation system united the exhibition. So the structure of the exhibition uh, became uh, uh, very much like that of a city, like uh, a small city inside of a big uh, mega city. So the purpose was to tell visitors the story the, of a big country, about its national, industrial, agricultural diversity. And by uh, 1970s, the compound was fully shaped and its uh, function changed. Apart from agriculture, it was uh, also uh, industries and amusement and culture. So why am I telling you all this? Because when this area became property of the government of Moscow after a devastation in 1980s, 1990s, where uh, you, there was a big, uh, like, uh, s uh, street trade with a lot of merchants. So people who grew in Moscow or who lived in Moscow, well, they uh, remember what how the territory was used. So later on, we started to think over how what principles we should use to uh, restore and renovate uh, the territory. And the team, which was invited, uh, defined that we need to preserve the cultural heritage uh, we got and the principles uh, we should use uh, in our work. And third, um, we need to define uh, the functionality uh, which would be in line with modern uh, requirements and demands of our guests, of our visitors, of our permanent visitors. And uh, modern requirements. So to work with this territory, if we would uh, talk about um, cultural heritage, so uh, this uh, era became like a, a landmark. So uh, the territory was um, uh, split into a number of segments. And we defined uh, uh, the regulations for every site on the territory, what was possible to do. Uh, with it and trying to reproduce the functionality which was um, intrinsically uh, a characteristic of the territory. So 
we uh, analyzed how the territory was used through its history, and we realized that apart from the uh, ideology, the main function was education, like enlightening people and organizing leisure time for thousands of people. So every year, uh, 24 million people visit uh, and we are among uh, global uh, tourist attractions in the world. Uh, so we split our territory into seven separate uh, territories or parks. So the main axis is the central part, the central alley, where we have uh, um, the whole of our main architectural uh, monuments. Um, so in terms of historical preservation and making uh, this territory function uh, as, as a single unit, so this is like a museum town uh, which was created by us. And apart from the museum compound, we have a big landscape park, uh, which is quite big uh, for a mega city like Moscow, uh, 92 hectares and uh, uh, the ring road. So we decided that it uh, should be used for recreation purposes. So um, we didn't uh, reinvent the bicycle. So these functions were programmed uh, in the master plan of 1935, but we um, uh, used all modern requirements to similar t areas. Also, education function, so the knowledge park, a uh, big uh, multi-purpose complex, and all work with the area uh, is based on the decree by our Ministry of Culture, which should preserve uh, historical sites uh, as part of historical legacy. For example, this educational function. Our landscaper um, park has a, a farm in a city, so uh, leisure and education are combined. So uh, children which live in a big city uh, can have contact with uh, the domestic animals, or can, they can milk cows, they can see uh, he, hen and peacock. So the territory of uh, the craftsman's park with traditional uh, arts and the museum function, which is uh, um, the core of our compound, so from 2014, we had more than 40 uh, major exhibitions here, including international shows like the mm, uh, an exhibition on astronautics uh, together with the a museum in London, uh, Space Museum in London. And so our key functions are education and enlightenment. The original function uh, that in her compound was based on. Thank you so very much, uh, Yekaterina, and I hope all of our listeners uh, will use that opportunity and will work uh, around the territory of Vadinhar again and see uh, how it's uh, changing and being renovated and we'll see what's going on. And I would like to thank all our panelists. Uh, so I would like to tell you that Kern. Ken uh, Bernstein will be speaking as part of Urban Festival on Sunday, on the 9th of July, uh, at the site of um, Legacy School. He will uh, talk us about uh, registering um, historical site in Los Angeles. And in this hall, we are having another session in 10 minutes' time.